So let's find out what they are, what A and B are, through normalization. So to normalize, we'll say here's our integral 0 to infinity, 0 to pi, 0 to 2 pi. And we're going to be looking at C1, the complex conjugate of C1, times C. And that's going to be multiplied by R squared sine theta dr d theta d phi. And we know that's going to be equal to 1. We still have this integral, 0 to infinity, 0 to pi, 0 to 2 pi. Well, this is just going to be a1 times 2s star plus b1 2pz star. That's going to be multiplied by the original function itself, a1 times 2s plus b1 times 2pz r squared sine theta dr d theta d phi, and it's equal to 1. I'm going to foil out these terms, 0 to infinity, integral of 0 to pi, 0 to 2 pi, and then I'm going to have a1 times a1, 2s star, 2s, plus a1, b1, 2s star, 2pz, plus b1, a1, 2pz star, 2s, plus b1, b1, 2pz star, 2pz, and then that's all times r squared sine theta dr d theta d phi, and that's equal to 1. I'm now going to employ normalized terms and orthogonal terms to simplify these integrals. I have a 2s star times 2s, the integral over all space, since they're normalized, then that's going to be equal to 1. I have 2s star times 2pz, these two states are orthogonal, so that's going to go to 0. I have 2pz star to 2s, an integral of those two terms over all space. They're orthogonal, so that ends up being equal to 0. 2pz star and 2pz, those two terms are normalized. And that means that's going to be equal to 1, which means that the result of this integral is a1 squared plus b1 squared is equal to 1. Now recall that we just found out when we did the orthogonality um, expression above, that we said that a1 is equal to b1. We saw that all four terms are going to be equal to the same. So we can actually simplify this and we can just say, well, a1 squared plus a1 squared is equal to 1, which means 2a1 squared is equal to 1, which means that a1 is equal to 1 over the square root of 2. And so then this implies that b1 is also equal to 1 over the square root of 2. What this also tells us is that a2, since it's the, the same value as a1, also is 1 over the square root of 2. And since b2 is the negative of b1, then that means then we've got the negative square root of 1 half. That means then I can write, finally, my molecular orbitals. I've got c1 and I've got c2. Well, that's just going to be equal to the square root of 1 half times the 2s orbital plus the 2pz orbital. And I'm going to have the square root of 1 half times the 2s orbital minus the 2pz orbital. And so it is these two states that, that define our sp hybridized orbital. And it is the fact that we have this minus sign here that says that we have this 180 degree difference between the direction that our C1 points in and the direction that C2 points in. And so it is by building up this expression that we have right here by solving for the coefficients that we've been able to determine the geometry of what an sp hybridized bond looks like. Here is another illustration of what the sp hybridized orbital looks like. Using BEH2 as an example, the sp hybridized orbital is shaded darker and interacts with the 2H atoms to form the molecule, where each hybridized orbital points 180 degrees from each other. Now let's look at the sp2 hybridized orbital. Consider the molecule BH3. The three boron-hydrogen bonds are equivalent and lie in a plane 
and we know that the sp2 hybridized orbitals are typically directed 120 degrees from each other. To demonstrate this angle, let's construct three hybrid orbitals on the boron atom using the 2s, the 2pz, and the 2px orbitals. We choose 2px instead of 2py because we'll arbitrarily let the molecule lie along the xz plane. The three hybridized orbitals are then constructed as linear combinations of the three atomic orbitals. We will use normalization and orthogonalization to verify that the angle between these three orbitals are 120 degrees in a class activity. Here is an image of the BH3 molecule showing the sp2 hybridized orbitals as well as the vacant py orbital.